from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Now, I really enjoyed researching this, researching this author and these books. I just thought it was so interesting as someone who I was never much of a writer, but I probably should have tried harder. Um, so now all of you kids who dream of seeing your name on a book need to pay attention for this author. So this Newbery Award winning author, Jack Gantos, inspires young writers to utilize their writing radar, which is a tool described in detail in this book of the same name, Writer Radar, using your journal to snoop out and craft great ideas. Jack is from Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, and has written books for readers of all ages, and has continued to write children's books, and has begun to teach courses in children's book writing and children's literature. See? Having so many talents can take you wonderful places, not unlike this event today. I'd say he is a jack of all trades, but that's a terrible joke. Uh, <laughs> But don't forget to stop by the book signing area between 4.30 and 5.30 today to meet Jack and have him sign a book for you. And without further ado, we welcome to the stage Jack Gantos. Okay. Was that the introduction? That must have been the introduction. Okay, this is one of those talks that's going to be like launched out of a shotgun. This is uh, 25 minutes and we've got a lot to cover when it comes to children's literature. Not only the books themselves, but the writing of the books. So we've got literature and then really what the purpose is today is to talk about how you can write your own good books. So you're going to walk out of here with some tips, some good stuff, and I better get to it. Otherwise, you're going to walk out with half a mind full of good stuff, and I want you to have a full mind. Okay. Nobody can ever talk about writing good books without talking about reading good books because all writing starts with reading. That is the first principle of writing a good book, being a good reader, right? So for me, when I was a kid, I was a kid. Let's see, move that forward. Does it go that way? The PowerPoint. Yeah. Hold on. Ah, there we are. Okay, there's the book. Now, boom, that's me. First grade, I went down to Mrs. Niederheiser's class. We didn't have kindergarten. I was in the backyard digging a hole. Somebody came by, slapped me on the head and said, hey, you should go to school. I was like, okay. So I walked down the hill in Western Pennsylvania, probably carried a lump of coal in my pocket. And I went down and Mrs. Niederhauser told me how to read. We played a lot of London Bridges. That's what I recall. But I did like books and I started reading a lot of picture books. And y'all have read a lot of picture books. You remember Brown Bear, Brown Bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. You remember the Hungry Caterpillar? You remember George and Martha books? You remember Lyle Crocodile? You remember all those fabulous books? Well, they get into you. So books got into me, and later on, boom, what was I writing? Picture books. Why? Because I read them, and I loved them. So the connection between what you read and what you write is a lock. Remember, choosing the books you love to read is also choosing the future of what you want to write. And then I got older. Amazing, I grew. And I started writing these books. 
family books of short stories because I became a diary writer as a kid. And I used to go to the dining room table with my diary, keep it on my lap. And when my dad would tell a funny story, I'd write it down. When my sister would tell a tragic story of her, well, 10th grade life, I would write it down. And so I always liked family stories. And therefore, um, and therefore, whoop, we went back. Now we're going forward. One more. There we are. Joey Pigza. So, whoa, where'd that go? Hold on. There's Joey. So the Joey Pigza stories. So when I was a kid, I was a bit of an active kid. I was like one of those, well, I, was, I wasn't off the charts active, but I was pretty active. And so later on, naturally, I wrote about who I was. And then I got a little bit older. That's my bicycle. I used to ride around my neighborhood with my diary in that basket and spy on everybody. I'll get to that. And then I wrote about my hometown, the town where somebody hit me on the head and said, go to school. That's it, Norvelt, Pennsylvania. And then, because I loved that town, I wrote about it. And then I got older. Oh, no. And I started reading middle school books. Therefore, I started writing them. And this book, this is about how my relatives taxiderm their mother. But, you know, <laughs> you think deer head on the wall? Only family. And so, and then I got older. I became like a senior in high school. And then I started writing books where I got into a little bit of trouble. And then I predicted my own trouble right there. Oh, my goodness. But let's go back here. Ah. Can you imagine that? So all these stages of my life and all the books I read at each stage caused me to write about every stage of my life. Again, the reading leads to the writing. Choose your books wisely. OK. So Writing Radar. So this is a book that I wrote that's going to give you some really good tips. It centers in on journal writing, because that's where it all starts. So using your journal. Uh, that's my journal. Now, you know all those journals you have lying around the house? You know how, like, every Christmas and birthday, somebody comes up and goes, here's a journal. And you write one word in it, and it goes on the shelf next to a whole shelf of journals that you have one word in it. So I would sometimes, my mother would say to me, hey, oh, this is how it would work. I'd go to my mom, I'm so bored. And she'd whip around and say, why don't you get your journal and write something? I'm like, ugh, wrong thing to say to mom. So I would open the journal. And you know those blank white sheets of paper in a journal? I would stare at them, they would stare at me. I would stare at them, they would stare at me. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but my mind would go blank and I'd feel like a complete loser. So that's how I felt with a journal. And then I read this book. Have you read Harriet the Spy yet? This is one of the world's great books. You only need two books to read, Harriet the Spy and Moby Dick, and you'll be all set. Now, well, George and Martha, too. I love those. And don't forget Miss Nelson is missing. That's another good one. Oh, I'm glad you do. That's made you a better person. Now. Harriet the Spy. So I was a library helper when I was at school. And I would go into the library, and this is how I would always have a great day at school. I'd walk into the library, and I'd say to the librarian, I'd go, you know what? I'm a great reader. And the librarian would go, I love you. You come with me. I will protect you from all the sociopathic children at this school. And so I used to put the books back on the shelf and help move things around. And I was always just a really good friend to the librarian. Well, in the meantime, 
In the meantime, I had this one little feeling that I wasn't doing what I needed to do with my journal because I kept thinking I should be writing. I love books. I want to see my name on a book, but I wasn't doing anything until I read Harriet. And you know what Harriet did? She walked around her neighborhood spying on everybody and writing it down. I thought, I'll do the same thing if I work for Harriet. So I went to the G section. My name is Gantos. I went to the G section of the library, and I stuck my hand into a slot where exactly where a book, if I had written a book where it would go, and I stuck my hand there, and I promised myself, I promised myself I would write a book, and it would go right between Galdone and George. Boom, right there. And then that so freaked me out, I ran out of the library. But I didn't forget. So here's what I did. I took my journal. This is my journal, my fifth grade journal. And I put it, you know that bike with the bicycle basket? I put it in that basket, and I rode around my neighborhood spying on everybody. So this is my first spy map. This map got me started. So this is Fort Lauderdale, Florida. See on the bottom? See that picture with the dog? That's my house, the Gantos family. My mother called us the high supervision family in the neighborhood. If you played at my house, you had rules and regulations. Nobody came to my house. If you came to my house, my mother would make you clean. So we all played over at the Pagoda family house. My mother called them the low supervision family in the neighborhood, and she forbid me to play there, but I was there every day. Because when you played with the pagodas, well, you came back bruised. It was good play. I'll get to them. They were a little nutty, a little dangerous, but they were great to write about. And then back to my house. See that dog in the backyard? That's my dog, Bobo. He was asleep in the backyard. An alligator came out of the canal and took that dog away. It was such a sad moment. And there I was, standing in the backyard, yelling at Bobo, come on, Bobo, you can get away, Bobo. But he did not get away, and I wrote about that. And I wrote and I cried in that book. I love that dog. And I wrote about the love of an animal that you always have and how it's such a pure love. And see that little circle in that square? That's called Jack Stain. That's where I ate three plates of spaghetti, walked into the living room, said to my mother, I think I'm going to be sick. She said, get to the bathroom. I didn't. I just looked at my mother and went, bleh, and threw up right at her. I missed her. I hit the wall, and we never could get the stain off of the wall. And in Florida, Florida's very humid. And on a humid day, that stain, the smell, that little vomity smell would just be like a shadow moving around the house. You'd wake up in the morning, sniff the air, you'd go, oh, the stain's visiting me today, you know. <laughs> Next door, Mr. Vellucci built a boat, launched it, sank in 15 minutes. Not good at that job. That's that dog over there that bit me with an airplane crash in our neighborhood. Oh, the frosts and hunts, grumpy old people in the neighborhood. In Florida, you had millions of them. And you know what they were? Retired school teachers. You know, had come down from Minnesota, you know, taught for 50 years, sick and tired of kids. And then you, as a kid, of course, you knew that instantly because you could nose it out. And then you go dancing across their yard. And they would then put out that sign that says, no standing on the yard, no walking on the yard. Then you'd dance across it, and then you'd go send out the dog, because they always had like a chihuahua that would come out, you know, like untie your shoe. You'd be like, oh, I'm so scared. <laughs> and then the M&Ms, I love them. The metric family. Now, they were something to write about. They had seven kids. And they gave each one of them an M first name, Michael Metric, Megan Metric, Marshall Metric, Michelle Metric. And then we just caught on. We started calling them the M&Ms, plain and peanut, two, melt in your mouth, not in your hand. And then we lined them up one day and went green M&M, yellow M&M, brown M&M, orange M&M. And we just knock on the door, hello, Mrs. M&M, can orange come out and play? You know? 
And then that's me, my brother Pete, my sister Betsy. This was the first bit of evidence that I had in my journal that I actually had good story material. So let's just pause for a moment. Remember Harriet the Spy? Going around spying on things. Drawing a map, getting it down. And then when you, you see it, you believe it, right? When you look at a blank sheet of paper, it gives you nothing. You look at a map, it gives you ideas. So then, I went to my house and I drew my house. So this is where I want you to start because you don't know your neighbors and they might just be psychotic. So I want you to just start with your house and even if they're sociopathic, they love you. So nonetheless, that's the dining room table. That's where I threw up on the wall. That's Zippy the Roach. My sister was taking a nap one day and we had had an argument and she always slept with her mouth wide open because she has allergies. And I had a little roach collection. You know those cockroaches in Florida, those really big ones? I had this huge Lego collection. And I used to make this giant walled city, medieval city called Roachville. And then I'd go outside and I'd capture all these Florida roaches, take my sister's nail polish and write names on the backs of them. And then you take a roach with a name on it, put it on a Hot Wheels car, scotch tape it on there, and then you could drive them all to Roachville, right? You have roaches have a dinner party, roaches run around, roaches go this way, that way. At any rate, when I saw her open mouth after our argument, I gave my jar of roaches a shake and I pulled one out that said Zippy on it. I said, Zippy, not good for you. What's he know? He's a roach. So I snuck over, leaned, aimed, and let him go. Straight down. Hit her on the lip, bounced up, right in the mouth, right? By then I turn around and I run back down the hallway and I dive into my bedroom and then I just listen deliciously. And I hear, uh, 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 and then I hear a shoe go whack, splat. And I'm like, ooh, not good for Zippy. <laughs> and then I hear down the hallway, thump, 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 and it's my sister. And she comes into my room and she looks at me and she goes, there's only one person sick enough in this house to do what just happened to me. And I'm like, that's right, that would be me. She goes, now you have to suffer a wicked punishment or I'm gonna tell mom. I'm like, well, what's the punishment? She said, take off all your clothes and run naked around the outside of the house. I said, I can't do that. She said, I'll tell mom, she'll kill you. I go, okay, I'll take the clothes off. So, cause my mom would have, and so, I took off all my clothes, I ran out the back sliding glass door, I ran screaming all the way around the house, I get back to the back door, click, she's locked the back door. I run to the window, she's locked every window. I dash to the front door, she beat me to the front door. And now a very naked, desperate boy is jumping up and down on the front porch. I have no idea what to do next. I look over at the pagoda's house next door, I see some laundry hanging on the line, things I've never seen before in my life. I go, I don't know what that is, but I gotta wear it. And so I run nakedly across the pagoda's yard when Mrs. Pagoda catches me out of her eye and yells out, what are you, some kind of a nut? I'm like, ah! I turn around, come back, still have no idea what to do, so I dive behind those bushes in the front of the house and I stay hunkered down sitting there whimpering nakedly until that evening my father pulls the car in the driveway and his naked son jumps out of a bush in front of the car thought my father was going to run me over i was crying i said she is so mean she is so wicked he said who are you talking about i said my sister betsy he goes well what did you do i said well i dropped a roach in her mouth he goes well <laughs> you know maybe you deserve this he said, now go in the house. You're embarrassing me naked out here. I said, oh, I've already been naked out here for hours. <laughs> At any rate, see that little story? That little just story just pops right off of the map. I can go around that map. Everything you see and draw on there, I've written a story about. And it all starts with your life. So the very first thing you need to do as a writer, the very first thing you need to do is put yourself first in your writing life. Right from the first person point of view. I said, I did, I am, I will. 
You see how powerful that I is, that first person? I'm in charge. That's what you want. Now, I want you to brainstorm in your journal. I want you to make a list to go with your map. Action words, brothers, sisters, parents, pets, dumb stuff. Don't leave dumb stuff off your list because that's 50% of literature. Secrets, disasters, schools, lying, finding stuff, public humiliation, that's like 49%. And then the rest is just 1%, like school, that's 1%. And then friends, maybe. Over there on the other side, see where it says emotional words? We all have a great, strong vocabulary for action. We have a weaker vocabulary for emotion, so we have to make sure we get some good, solid, emotional lead words. Confused, proud, curious, bored, love, jealous, panic, trusting, awkward, brave, amused, powerless. Isn't that great, huh? Don't you just feel that way as a kid some days? Powerless. And then accomplished, that's always good. And then that goes in your journal with that map. And then you take that very same map and I want you to go with every action drawing you have and then add an emotion, a strong emotion. So like where I dropped that roach in my sister's mouth, right? It's a zippy the roach, pain. I suffered pain, physical and emotional. So not only do you have the action, now you also have the emotion. And when you're thinking of literature, you say, what is literature? Literature, the answer to that is all the action in the physical world and all the emotion on the inside. So you're always working both sides of the human condition. The physical world, the interior world. The dropping the roach, the suffering of the pain. So then, from there, you need to organize your story. So I want you to just draw a little chart like this. So it's already in the book, so you can get it that way. Character setting problem, that goes right to the beginning, right? Characters, me and my sister, setting the living room. Problem, eh, we've been bickering. Situation, I drop a roach. Action, right, action. Then I have to run around the house. I'm trying to get some clothes. Crisis, the door is locked. Resolution, solve the problem. I can't solve that problem. I have to hide in the bushes all day. And then the double ending, remember this. Remember the physical world, the emotional world? Why would you have a double ending? Because you need an ending for the physical and an ending for the emotional. Physical world, finally got some clothes back on. Emotional world had to come to the conclusion that my sister was smarter and tougher than me. Now, character setting problem right to the beginning, action crisis to the middle, resolution, physical and emotional ending. So now you have a journal, you've got a map. On the map you've got physical, you've got emotional, and you also have a structure. You know what you need next? Discipline. So here's what I do. Every day I wake up in Boston where I live. My rule in life is live next door to the library because I write all my books in the library. So I get up, I feed the cats, and then after I feed the cats, I go to the library. I do two hours of first draft writing, two hours of second draft writing, two hours of reading, four hours of rewriting, I go home, which is close because I live next door to the library. And here's what I'm asking you to do. 10 minutes a day, that's all I want. 10 minutes a day. You're young writers, you're just starting out. You're just getting your journal set up like a real professional writer's journal. So start with 10 minutes. You draw that map, you focus in on something. You just write furiously for 10 minutes. You don't know where it's going, don't worry about it. Just get it in there. Next day, 10 minutes. Next day, 10 minutes. It builds, builds, builds. Two weeks, now you've captured that really good first draft of a story. Then you bring the structure to it, you polish it up, and then you have something called literature. And it's all about you. How am I doing? Am I done? I'm just about done, okay. Boom. So drafts. Now, I do 100 drafts. I'm not asking you to do 100 drafts. I just want a couple. 
point of view. Remember what that point of view is? First person, right? I am, I said. Structure, apply all elements of writing, beginning, middle, end. We just did that with that cockroach story. Physical draft, then I want you to read your story and make sure all the physical details are in there. Then go back and read it and make sure all the emotional details are in there. Then theme, hey, what's that story about? My sister's smarter than me. Make sure you get that in there. Dialogue, make sure your characters speak. When your characters speak, they pop alive. They become three-dimensional and you're a genius. And then descriptions and right words. You want to make sure you love the language. Make it poetic, make it beautiful, make it represent the best of what you can do. Then you review what it is, then you rake out all those extra varies, ands, if, buts, and that word like, which nobody likes anyway, but you got to keep 50% of them for similes. But nonetheless, you clean it all up, and that's when it starts looking good. And then you, bam, you put your name on it, and that's a piece of work that you're proud of, you worked hard up, hard for, and I will be reading your good book. Because I have talked straight through for 25 minutes, we do not have time for questions, but I thank all of you for being here. This is a great festival. I love it. Thank you, DC. Good luck with your writing. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.